and uh, I'm going to speak about uh, shellfish and how which shellfish we qualify to the Southern Challenge. So, who are we? So, shellfish is a, is a team of security enthusiasts. What do we do? We do research in system security, that means that we publish papers on different security topics, and we play out the text of the petitions, and we also release some tools that I'm going to uh, speak about them later. So, so Shelly started in 2004 at the Center of the University of California, Santa Barbara. And it's a nice place, but we like to stay inside the building in front of monitors. And uh, so then Shelly is expanded to other, even to other places, uh, such as Northeastern uh, University, that, as you can see, it has a very different weather and uh, interacting with friends. And so we have Shelly in the latest, in the last year, we had uh, people playing with us uh, from all over the world, and uh, we just need people from Australia. So if you know someone from Australia, that would be nice. But, uh, so, as I said, we play in security competitions, typically for the CDF, from the university competition, or typically have to go to the Comment tu sais ce qu'il y a dedans Et hier on m'a sorti euh, la traduction française de tout spoil. Je trouve ça génial. Ouais c'est pas mal. Thank you. 
So, as I say, starting 2014, qualification events was uh, about one year ago, and now and, and seven teams qualified from for the final event. It will be at a will be August 4th uh, at DEFCON, that is the huge uh, security conference in Las Vegas. So. CGC, which is the abbreviation of DARPA Cyber Grand Challenge, CGC is an attack defense CTF, but instead of uh, uh, players, instead of solving security challenges, they have to develop a system that automatically solves these challenges. And so the focus here is, of course, on uh, automation, and uh, in particular what you have to do is to exploit vulnerable vulnerabilities in binaries that so you are provided with some binaries, you, need to automatic, you have to develop a system that is able to automatically, uh, to automatically find vulnerabilities in these binaries, but also to patch these binaries. It means to correct the, the vulnerability that allows uh, exploitation. And as I say, no human intervention is possible. So everything has to generate exploits, and uh, what, 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 does it mean? what is the real meaning of exploit? What is the precise definition? So for the qualification round, an exploit was just, uh, was just something that, it was just an input that when provided to the binary, the binary was crashed. And, and, uh, for, uh, and also patch the binary. So what is a patch? A patch is a fixed <laughs> binary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. A patch is a fixed vulnerability, and, uh, and you need to preserve the original binary functionality. So you cannot just you cannot just change your binary so that uh, it just returns. Because if your binary just returns, okay, the, the binary is, uh, is not exploitable, but the functionality is completely corrupted. And also, uh, performance, perform performance impact of the, these patches is evaluated so that, for instance, if your patch, maybe your patch is uh, checking all possible memory accesses, but you might end up in having a too, too big uh, CPU overhead, and so the evaluation of your patch will be, uh, will be low. So, so for CGC, the binaries that were provided uh, for CGC, uh, they were more or less realistic programs, but they, they run in a simplified environment. We simplify system calls and simplify inter-process communication. In particular, the architecture was a standard Intel, a Intel x86, 32-bit, but these binaries uh, are supposed to run in an in a operating system called Decree, that is just a let's say, a simplified version of Linux where you only have seven syscalls, like you can transmit, receive data on different sockets, and you can uh, select on these sockets, you can allocate the allocate memory, you can generate random numbers, and you can terminate. So that's it. So there are no signals, no threads, no shared memory, no, not even a file system. And also standard defense techniques that are usually in place uh, in, in modern uh, in modern operating systems uh, are not there. So the stack is executable, there is no randomization, and so you are free to implement these uh, defenses as a patch to the binaries, but of course you need to also consider the, the performance impact these patches are uh, bringing to those uh, binaries. And also, of course, you need to do it in a way that your, your binary functionality is not compromised, so you need to do it very carefully. And so uh, this, is what, this is just an overview of what we developed for the qualification rounds. So for the qualification rounds, we were, uh, we were uh, provided with vulnerable binaries, and our system that in DARPA terminology is called a cyber reasoning system, our system was supposed to, as I said, ex uh, provide uh, exploits and patch binaries. So this is a little, a little more, little bit more detailed view. So vulnerable binaries were passed to a automatically a vulnerability finding component and to an automatic patching component. So the vulnerability finding component uh, was uh, generating proposed exploits, and then these exploits were going also to the patching component because some of the patches were targeting the specific exploits. 
and then we um, we output both propose propose, propose uh, patches, and then both exploits and patches are evaluated. And of course, we pick the best one, so the the, the most reliable one and the, the one with less uh, performance impact. And we submit uh, those uh, pro those exploits and those patches to DARPA for uh, for uh, scoring. So as I said, uh, one of the components we developed for, uh, for uh, the CGC was an automatic vulnerability discovery component. And so I'm going to introduce how you can, how can, you can uh, develop a system that automatically finds vulnerability. So for the qualification round, the, the, um, the question we wanted to, to answer was, how do I crash a binary? Because for the qualification, an exploit was just a, an input making the program crash. So this question is some, somehow a subset of a bigger question that is, how do I reach a specific state in a binary? And uh, so this is in general a not decidable uh, question, a not decidable problem, but there are two approaches that more or less can uh, give you an answer, at least in some cases. So. One is called fuzzing, and the other is called uh, symbolic execution. So let's see both of these uh, approaches. So <clears throat> I put some code. It's just an easy program that gets uh, an input from the user, checks two conditions of this input, and then it either, it either prints a you win or you lose. And uh, <clears throat> suppose that we want to, uh, to answer the question, how can I reach the, the state in which you win is printed? So, of course, an easy solution is just to try different numbers. So you try one, and you lose a sprinted. You try two, still you lose a sprinted. But if you try 10, you win a sprinted, because 10 verifies uh, both conditions. And so this is a very uh, easy way, so to speak. And in particular, for CGC, we use a, a, a particular type of fuzzing called coverage-guided fuzzing that means that we were f our system were focusing on those inputs that cover the most the binary that so those inputs that execute uh, more instructions inside the binary and our system was based and is based on AFL that is uh, a very famous uh, open a uh, very famous uh, public uh, fuzzer and fuzz fuzzing works very well in a, in a lot of cases but there are some uh, specific cases in which fuzzing does not really work. And let's see one of these cases. So suppose that now I change the second condition to from x less than 100 to x squared equal to a big number. And so now if I try random inputs for my code, it's very unlikely that just by trying random numbers, I will be able to print, uh, to reach the condition in which the text uh, uin is printed. So. A different approach is called symbolic execution. So let, let's look at how symbolic execution works in the original example and how it works in this more complex example. So the idea of a symbolic execution is to interpret the binary code and replace any user input with symbolic variables. So at the first instruction, we have user input. And so we don't know the value of this input because it's coming from the user. So we just keep track of it as a symbolic variable x. And then the, the execution goes on. And of course, if we encounter a branch instruction, we don't know which one of the two branches we are supposed to take because we don't know the real value of x. So we take both branches, but we keep track of constraints that those conditional instructions are imposing on the, on the execution. So for instance, in one case, the constraint is x bigger or equal than 10. In the other case, the constraint is le x uh, less than 10. So the, the execution goes on, executing all the feasible paths. And uh, for instance, if we execute the path in which uh, x is less than 100, we add the constraint x less than 100. So then, at some point, we will reach the condition we were looking for, that is, uh, the text you win is printed. And so now we ask to the symbolic execution engine to give us, to concretize the collected constraints. That means to give us a concrete input that satisfies these constraints. So we collected two constraints, x big, bigger or equal than 10 and x less than 100. So a possible solution is 99. 
And, the, uh, and in fact, if we try 99 as input to this program, we will, um, we will reach uh, the condition in which uh, the text uh, you win is printed. So if we move from the simple example to the more complex one, we see that for uh, symbolic execution, this is just a matter of having a, a slightly different constraint. So now we have the constraint x squared equal to that big number. But still, a, a symbolic solver can still uh, provide us a solution to this problem. And in this case, the solution is x equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we use symbolic execution for CGC. And in particular, we use symbolic execution uh, from Anger, that is this uh, binary analysis platform developed at UCSB. And in particular, so we were looking for inputs that were making the binary uh, crash. And so we were looking, for instance, for memory accesses outside allocator regions or unconstrained instruction pointer. That means a, 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 a state in which the instruction pointer of the program can assume any value, for instance, we have uh, some user input going to a register and then jumping to that register. So in that case, the instruction pointer can assume any, any value. And so if either the condition 1 or condition two, 2 is true, it means that we found an input that will make the program crash. That, was, that is w what uh, we were interested in. And uh, so we, are, we, we also studied how to merge the two approaches. And in particular, we, uh, pay, uh, our lab published a paper called uh, Driller that has been published on the NDSS uh, February 2016. And this paper uh, studies how to merge these two approaches. And <laughs> what is interesting is the following. If these are all the binaries we were provided for the qualification, <laughs> These are the binaries uh, that we were able to find the crash using just fuzzing. So this is in, in scale. And these are the binaries we were able to find the crash using symbolic execution. But combining the two approaches, we were able to find more than just the sum of, this, of the two approaches single, uh, alone. And you can find details about this in the paper called Driller. And uh, OK. So, as I said, our symbolic execution well, and also driller are based on uh, Anger, that is, the, that is the binary platform developed at UCSB. So I'm not one of the developers of Anger, so if you have super technical questions, I'm not sure I can answer. But anyways, <clears throat> Anger is an open source uh, project. You can, you can find it on GitHub. Uh, please put a star. And uh, it's an architecture-dependent uh, system, and of course, it's compatible with normal ELF, with CGC ELF, but also with Windows and other architectures. And uh, <coughs> it's written in Python, so it's uh, allegedly easy to use. And uh, you can install it with one or maybe two different commands, at least on Ubuntu 14. And uh, you can interact with it with, uh, using IPython, like, like an interactive shell. And so I'm go now I'm going to show you in a, in a, de a demo of how we can use Anger to, in this case, to um, find a, an input that makes a program uh, crash. So I'm going to show you how to apply Anger to this binary called uh, Cadet1. It is a very easy sample binary uh, DARPA uh, release uh, for CGC. And what this binary does is just checking if a string is a palindrome. So we can run it here. So I can put uh, any string, and it, it will tell me, no, this string is not a palindrome. If I put a palindrome, it, 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 this binary will tell me it's a palindrome. So the reason why I'm using a dot adapted version is because this is a CGC binary, so and this is a Linux machine. So to run it on a standard Linux machine, we had to recompile it. So. <laughs> This binary has a classical uh, buffer overflow. In particular, uh, it's 128 uh, bytes are read from user input, and they are placed in a 64 bytes uh, uh, buffer. So an attacker can exploit this to corrupt the memory, in particular, to write some uh, data on the stack. And so through this, you can hijack control flow and have and having basically arbitrary code execution. So how can Anger find 
this uh, condition. Let, let's see. OK. So we can open IPython. So we import Tanger. And we can create a new project. So now we have a new project. So what we want to do is to create a path group. So a path group is a is basically a, a data structure used to hold all different paths that the symbolic execution discovers during the execution of this program. So we need to do this. I'm going to copy and paste. So we just do basically project.pathgroup. And we need this option, save unconstrained, because in this case, we are specifically interested in unconstrained paths. That means that the user input control the execution of this program. So now we can just uh, we can just step the program just to see. So if we step, we see that the path group uh, contains one active path, and if we see the the path, it means that we have our execution is at this address. And if we look at that address in IDA, we'll see that that address is just the entry point of the binary. We can do another step. And we can see that now we are at this other address that is the second basic block of the, of the binary. So you can use Angular just to, sim to execute a binary. But as, as, we said, as I said, in this case, I'm interested in finding, uh, in finding an input that, that makes the program crash by, uh, by um, reaching a state in which uh, user input controls the the, the instruction pointer. And this state is called an unconstrained state. So what I can do is I can just do an easy, an easy while loop. So in this while loop, I check if the length of the list containing our constrained paths is bigger than one, I exit. Otherwise, I just, I just step. So now it's stepping. It should take 10 seconds, probably. And at some point, we are going to get an answer, ideally, hopefully. OK, so now it means that Anger found an uh, unconstrained state. We can actually, we can actually save this state uh, in, a, in a variable. And then what we can do is <coughs> we can dump the, the content of STD in, in this state. And it means that we can dump what the user is supposed to input into this binary to actually reach this unconstrained state. So we do state.posic.dump, 0 is std in, and we save it in a file. OK, so now if we, if we look at the content of that file, we see that it's basically just a lot of null bytes. And as a matter of fact, if we cut, if we cut this file into, into the program, the program crashes with the segmentation fault. So that's good, because this was a, a, something like this is a valid exploit for the qualification. And I'm going to show you another example of how you can use Anger. So this binary also has an Easter egg. So this is the code you can, that I use. You can, use it, you can get it from the slides later. So an Easter egg. So it means that if you, if you input a string uh, starting with the, that accent character that is called a caret character, if you input a string like that, the text uh, Easter egg is printed. We can actually try this. And uh, if we input something like this, the text uh, Easter egg is printed. So, Anger, so we can ask Anger to actually without knowing anything about this binary, to actually give us an answer about how we can reach this Easter egg. And so, OK. So in particular, what we can do if we look at the binary, for instance, in IDA, we, know, we see that when we reach this instruction, the Easter egg is going to be printed. And so we ask Anger how to provide us an input that when provided to the binary, that instruction is going to be executed. So this is going to take some time. So I'm going to start it and, and then describe it.
OK. So these are the instructions I just pasted. So as before, you input Angular, you create a new, you create a new project, and then you need to basically disable this option in a, so that you use less memory. And uh, OK, you can find all the details about this in the documentation. And then, as before, you generate a path group. And then you just call path group dot explore. You put the address you want to reach. And then, eventually, you will find a, a state. A state, that means a, a, a state in which you have an input that is actually reaching that, that instruction. So this is going to take a while. So maybe I can go on and then show it to you. Right now, Anger is doing computations. And he's also complaining because it found a state in which, uh, basically, this means that it found a state in which uh, the instruction pointer is unconstrained because this program is actually vulnerable. So Anger is somehow, this is somehow an anomalous condition. So he's giving this as, as a warning to us. But I think it should be done in uh, 30 seconds, maybe. Let's see. Maybe more? Anyways, let's go. Let's wait. OK. So it reached a state. It saved the, the, the input in this file. So if we look at that file, that file is actually starting with the with a caret character as expected. And if we cut that file into our binary, uh, we'll see the Easter egg. So you see the Easter egg is printed. So <clears throat> these are just two easy examples. You can find tons of examples in, a, in the Angular repository called Angular doc, including this example. And also, you can find how Angular can be used to solve uh, a lot of different CTF challenges. That is probably the main usage right now of, of Angular, except for CGC and for papers. And so, let's speak about so let's speak about the finals of the CyberGun challenge. So, so, seven teams qualified for the finals. It's Shellfish is one of them, and in particular, we exploited the four, 44 binaries out, out, to, out of the 131 binaries we were provided with. And every qualified team received uh, $750,000. That is good to have. And uh, so you can read. Uh, so basically, all the I didn't speak about patching much in this talk. But if you are interested in it, into patching all the team submissions for the qualification, you can find them on that link. If you like doing uh, reversing, you can just reverse all of them. And you can study how different teams implemented patching uh, patches differently, how they inject the code inside binaries, and also what, do, what did they try to defend with these patches? Did they try to just do some specific checks? Did they try to check all the memory accesses? It's pretty interesting to do. But there are a lot, a lot of binaries, so it's a long work that, of course, we partially did for in preparation of the final event. And so in the final event, the setup will be a little bit different. So it will be a round base attack defense CTF with zero, with zero human intervention allowed. And because in a qualification, we were not allowed to look uh, into manually into binaries and to find manually uh, solu uh, exploits for them. But we were allowed to, for instance, uh, fix bugs in our infrastructure. For the finance, we, were, we, we will not be allowed to to fix our infrastructure. So we need to have a system that is able to run for hours, synchronizing different information without, without any human intervention. So that's pretty scary because, of course, we may maybe we miss a semicolon somewhere, and everything will crash, and we will get zero points. So there is a lot of testing we are doing, like a lot. Like every commit is tested. There is a, a lot of infrastructure just to test everything. And also, during the finals, uh, data about previous rounds is available to, to your system. So basically, you can receive network traffic that other teams are sending against your binaries. You can also, uh, uh, you can also get patches that other teams submitted. And so 
It can even be possible to steal patches from other teams or to study network traffic to somehow steal exploits. So this brings to a lot of questions on how maybe you should not immediately deploy a patch because maybe someone else could steal it. There is a lot of meta gaming that, of course, different teams will probably implement in different ways. So also exploits are, are different. So for qualification, an exploit was just a binary, an input making the binary crash. For, uh, for the finals, an exploit will be either, a, either an input that makes the binary crash, but at a specific location, and also setting a given register to a given value. And or an, an exploit could also be a, an input that when provided to the binary, the binary leaks some information, some data from a specific memory page. And so because of this, we need, of course, a more realistic exploit generator, which just uh, something that tells us how to crash the binary is not enough. We need to move from a crash to a real exploit. In addition, in, on top of all of this, every team could also deploy network level filtering rules that are just uh, network level uh, rules that you can deploy so that you can stop traffic from reaching your binaries um, at the network level. So as part of the finals, every team has access to a cluster of 1,280 cores, 16 terabytes of RAM, 128 terabytes of storage. And this is uh, basically a rack of one, uh, for one of the team. So DARPA is bringing seven of these guys inside an hotel in Vegas. And I think they are also bringing a half a megawatt generator to power all of them and to cool them. So this is going to be interesting. And of course, when we got access, the first thing we did was HTOP. And then we did HTOP on all of them. And it took us like probably two hours to generate this screenshot. And uh, what else? So finance will be, uh, will be uh, at DEF CON in uh, Vegas, uh, August 4th. So it's less than one month. And there will be money prizes. So first team is going to get $2 million. Second team is going to get $1 million in the third place will be $750,000. And also, the winning team will compete against human teams at the standard DEF CON CTF. So this means that this year, DEF CON CTF will be in a CGC format and so, so that uh, the machine and the humans could play together against each other. And this also means, and if I understood correctly, the winning team will have access to the entire seven cluster, so it's going to be something like 100 terabytes of RAM and 10,000 cores, something like that. So that is going to be very interesting. But of course, we don't know who will be the winning team. And uh, what else? Let me just finish with this a picture of all of us that were for the qualification. And as you can see, we have people from all over the world. And this is a picture of us working at the finals. And with this picture, we achieved two goals. So first of all, we all look uh, very weird. And also, Italians pass Americans. And so with this, I'm ready to answer to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Do you have a, any questions in the audience? I'm giving you a free t-shirt for a question. You want a free t-shirt? Or you want, just want a question? Oh. Free t-shirt given. So you can find the slides there, either information. Hi. Um, when um, the script that showed the single stepping, uh, what performance are we to expect from that? From what? The single stepping, one step to the other. What kind of impact does it have on performance? During Sorry, I didn't get it. During symbolic execution? Or? When you were doing this uh, symbolic execution, if you go back in the script. Yes. OK. Ah, you, yeah. Which kind of performance? Yeah, uh, what, what delay does it have? If yes. I execute the, the executable, and then I execute it with anger. What, yeah. What, what? So if you do just symbolic execution, you are, especially because this in Python is probably going to be hundreds of times slower than a normal execution. And let's say that there, is, there has been a lot of research on trying to avoid of just doing blindly symbolic execution, but 
as I say, to mix uh, phasing that is like normal execution with symbolic execution only when it is needed. So, but yes, symbolic execution is very slow, and even more, the, the biggest problem is uh, memory. Because uh, you need to keep track of all the paths you are exploring, and of course, when you have a branch, you don't know which path to get. You need to keep track of two paths, but then if this branch is inside the loop, you get, you get to what is called an exponential expo explosion of paths. So yes, yeah, symbolic execution in itself is not very efficient, for okay. sure. And what solver are you using? So Anger is using uh, VEX to transform uh, um, uh, assembly instructions to an intermediate representation. And then uh, VEX, uh, the solver is Z3. Okay. Yeah. OK, thank you. Very good presentation. OK, one last question. I saw someone over there. There. Oh, sorry. You, don't worry, you have time later to speak with uh, the speaker uh, after the talk. Uh, have you considered using uh, QMU or any kind of uh, virtualization or uh, system emulation for performance reasons or um, software controls? So I, I don't know where you are. Uh, anyway, uh, there. Okay. Here, there. Okay. So we are using QMU. So uh, let's say so. Uh, CGC binaries are in this special format. So DARPA provides you a virtual machine to run them. Nothing prevents you to run them outside the virtual machine in a modified QEMU environment. And we, uh, so your question is if QEMU is, is, is putting a lot of uh, performance overhead? No? Mm, sorry? So is your question uh, how QEMU is impacting performance? If you use QEMU at all, and why did you not use it? Uh, I don't have precise data about this, but I think Quimo is, I think is typically almost as fast as a, as a normal system. I don't think Quimo is doing a lot of, is putting a lot of uh, performance impact. And uh, there may be specific cases in which Quimo is slow when you, maybe you need to emulate syscalls or some, or of course if you want to do analysis on top of Quimo, then it might be slow. But QEMU in itself is pretty fast. And EFL is actually using QEMU to uh, dynamically execute uh, these binaries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Okay.